welcome to Reportage. This is Danish Bin Nabi. In today's segment of Reportage, I am joined by author and journalist Mr. Minhas Merchant to talk about his recently released book, Modi, The Challenge of 2024, which is published by Emeralist Publishing House. The book details about the Prime Minister Narendra Modi journey, how he, along with his two major politicians, Amit Shah and Yogi Adityanath, makes it sure that BJP remains an election-winning giant. Let's listen into Mr. Merchant. Mr. Merchant, let me start from the beginning with this wonderful book you have written on Modi. Explain me the role of Rajnath Singh. How was he instrumental in bringing Prime Minister Narendra Modi to the center stage of politics? Uh, Mr. Advani? Mr. Rajnath Singh. Ah, Rajnath Singh. Okay. No, Rajnath Singh, it's very clear. You see, in the year 2012, when uh, Mr. Modi, shortly after winning the December 2012 Gujarat elections, his third consecutive Gujarat election triumph, he became a national ca a candidate in his view. Obviously, Mr. L.T. Advani uh, had other points of view. And the entire situation boiled down to whether the BJP should choose Mr. Modi as the prime ministerial candidate or Mr. Advani, because he was the uh, he was regarded as the main leader of the BJP up to 2011-12. Now, once 2013 came along, Mr. Rajnath Singh made it very clear that he felt, as did many others in the BJP, that Mr. Modi had a better chance of leading the BJP to victory in the 2024, uh, the 2014 election. Now, why was that the case, um, Danish? Simply because by 2013, in the first quarter of 2013, already the UPA too had begun to uh, unravel. And uh, there was policy paralysis. The finance and home ministers had played musical chairs with each other, uh, Pranav Mukherjee and Chidambaram. So there was a lot of, there were a lot of problems. A Nazari movement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, GDP growth had fallen, inflation was high. So the BJP realized in 2013 quite clearly, as did everyone else, that the BJP had a strong chance to win the 2014 election. So who's the man to lead them? Most people thought Advani, but increasing numbers after the 2012 December Gujarat Assembly election victory for Mr. Modi felt that Mr. Modi is in fact a better candidate and he will have more popular support. So Rajnath Singh took matters in his own hand at the Goa conclave in June of 2013. He proposed and it was accepted because Mr. Advani didn't come for that conclave because he was already upset at the way things were going in favor of Mr. Modi by June of 2013. So he avoided that meeting in Goa, the conclave. Rajnath Singh in that, those two or three days got the proposal through to make Mr. Modi the campaign head. He couldn't make him the prime ministerial candidate as yet. This was step number one. So Rajnath Singh's role when he recognized that the party comes before personalities. And if you want the party to win, pick the most likely candidate to put up a fight and win. And he said that was Mr. Modi. Many people agreed with him in Goa. And that's the role that Rajnath Singh played because two months later, or three months later, actually, in September of 2013, the, um, the, the uh, party, the BJP, uh, at, their con at their final meeting, uh, made Mr. Modi the prime ministerial candidate. It took three months, from June to September, to go from head of the campaign uh, committee to the prime ministerial candidate against the wishes of Mr. Adwani, who had to be finally convinced by a phone call and and even meetings with the RSS uh, top leadership, including Mr. Pankwath. So that's the role of Mr. Rajpati. As, as you explain in this book about the relationship between Vajpayee and Advani, how different is the relationship between Modi and Shah? Yeah, okay. So, Danish, um, the relationship between Vajpayee and Advani evolved over 20 or 30 years, even longer. Now, Mr. Advani, was always the second in command. Mr. Vajpayee was the leader. The BJP itself 
was formed in 1980, April 1980. So at that time, Mr. Advani was an MP from Delhi. Um, so he had uh, uh, control over things, but Mr. Vajpayee was had a national uh, image. Mr. Vajpayee started off in the mid 80s. If you look at his speeches, if you listen to his speeches, as a hard Hindutva warrior, he talked about many, many things and how Hindus had been discriminated against and how you know things should be different. So he was very much a Hindutva plus man. Uh, Adwani was in the background. That relationship gradually changed by the mid 1990s. Mr. Vajpayee realized he had seen what happened with the United Front government and the collapse of uh, the, the Narasimha Rao government in 1996. Not the collapse, but the end of the Narasimha Rao government. He saw what happened to Mr. Devi Gowda and to Aki Gutra and the 13 day government of Vajpayee and how that was lost. He knew that it's only by becoming more inclusive and taking lots of parties across the ideological spectrum, including Omar Abdullah, Mamata Banerjee, who both joined his cabinet eventually, that he would be able to get BJP into a position of forming a government. And that is exactly what he did. So therefore, Mr. Advani gradually became the Hindutva warrior. He'd already had the Rati Yatra and all, which Modi, by the way, choreographed in 1990. But uh, Mr. Advani gradually became the hard Hindutva man, while Mr. Vajpayee recessed into the background, not into the background in the normal sense of the word, but metaphorically in terms of being the Hindutva hard uh, liner. And Mr. Advani took on that baton, as it were, in a relay race. Now, that relationship between Vajpayee and Advani was a very successful relationship. Mr. Vajpayee could be poetic, go to Pakistan, do all kinds of stuff make himself to almost look like a congressman, a Nehruvian uh, BJP person. While Advani continued to pursue the agenda of the BJP and the RSS. But the relationship between Mr. Shah and Mr. Modi, if that is the, uh, the point, is completely different because Mr. Modi is not Mr. Vajpayee. Mr. Modi has throughout, unlike Mr. Vajpayee, he's not He's been able to compartmentalize himself. But unlike Mr. Vajpayee, he's not shifted into the Nehruvian mold. On the contrary, he, he takes no opportunity, he loses no opportunity to criticize the Nehruvian consensus. So uh, while Mr. Shah, Amit Shah, remained in the background for a long period of time, um, and Mr. Modi took center stage in the first term of Mr. Modi, 2014 to 2019, Mr. Shah was only the BJP president. Mr. Modi inherited a broken economy. There was policy paralysis, NPAs were gargantuan, and there were lots of problems, not only non-performing assets and bank, evergreening of uh, bank loans, but uh, the economy was in a shambles. So the first term was to repair a broken engine of a government. In 2019, Mr. Shah became the home minister. The relationship changed. Mr. Shah became more and more of the Hindu to a warrior, like Mr. Advani had been. And Mr. Modi gradually became more of a global statesman. His second term, 2019 to early next year, is a very, very strange kind of term because there were two black swan events, COVID-19, the class of two, two and a half years, and of course, the Ukraine war with trade disruptions and oil price hike and so on. He's had to manage the economy and pass a lot of legislation. But Mr. Shah being the, uh, the main uh, convener of those legislations, the Kashmir one, the reorganization of JNK, the um, CAA uh, uh, law, the, the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, and um, uh, many others. So Mr. Shah became a uh, person who was in the front line of Hindutva. He took charge of JNK. Article 370 went. Article 335A uh, went along with it because they were read down. And um, um, then, of course, was the CAA. Mr. Shah, of course, had a problem during COVID when he had bad health. 
and the way he handled the CAA Shaheen Bagh protests and many other things, including um, when then President Trump came to India and there were riots in February of 2020. Uh, he drew criticism, but he continued his hard Hindutva uh, avatar and Mr. Modi became more inclusive and we've seen the apogee of that happening in the G20, where he became a he, he was a global statesman and interacting with people like Joe Biden, Rishi Sunak, and the French President Emmanuel Macron. So that transition now, as it comes to the end of the second term of Mr. Modi, is just as much by and Advani had a slightly different kind of uh, relationship, uh, much by moving towards inclusivity of a completely uh, of a particular kind. Mr. Modi has been able to compartmentalize himself without moving uh, in the March by fashion uh, to the center by being, when he's on the election campaign trail, a complete Hindu to a warrior and talking about, well, not polarizing or whatever the effect is, but certainly um, talking in terms of, of, of being a Hindu to a plus person when he's on the global stage being an inclusive global statesman, where his tone, body language all require a different um, measure of statesmanship. And uh, when he's touring villages or going to his own um, constituents in Varanasi uh, and talking to the poor, focusing on the welfare benefits that he's been able to give to the poor. But Mr. Merchant, explain this thing to me. What about the minorities, especially Muslims? In your book, you also mentioned that they need to be Indians first, then the Muslims. Is, right. is, is, is Prime Minister Narendra Modi taking care of these minorities? Yeah, I think so. Don't forget that when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, and most people don't realize this, he evicted Praveen Tagadia, the VHP head from Gujarat. He destroyed temples which were encroaching on public property and land. How many so-called secular uh, chief ministers have been able to demolish either mosques or temples? Mr. Modi demolished temples. Now, of course, there was 2002. That's a controversial subject. And Andy Marino has written a book. Many others have written books. Some of them have been objective. Some of them have been completely um, wrongful in their analysis. Uh, that will take another um, uh, session. But as far as uh, secularism is concerned and uh, the whole thing of minorities, Mr. Modi makes this a simple comment. I mean, I make this comment and I've written about this for 20 or 30 years that I think the Congress and its allies like the SP and the RJD and, and many others, uh, the TMC certainly, have used Muslim polarization for decades, and that has damaged our social polity. What the BGP is doing in reaction to that is engaging in Hindu polarization. And why has it got traction, which it did not have under Vajpayee? Because under Modi, people see in him as a Hindu to a warrior, which they found in Vajpayee was not the case. But what about because the polarization that, that, that has happened in the entire state. length and breadth of the country? What about the polarization? Right? The polarization has been going on for centuries, Danish. Why are people blind to this fact? Under the British Empire, for example, the Mughal Empire was devastating. Not only, you know, people say Akbar was great, of course he was. But, but Mr. Murray, let me finish. Mr. Then Mr. there was Aurangzeb. said. It was a despot, an absolute despot. Uh, Hindus were the victims for hundreds of years under the Mughal Empire and before that other uh, invaders in Central Asia. Then you had the British Empire and the British treated Muslims as a co-martial race where they felt that, ah, Hindus lowest tier, Muslims middle tier because they are co-martial and the British at the top. So the average Hindu was subjugated for hundreds of years under the Mughals, hundreds of years, 190 years to be precise, under the British, and then came Nehru, independence. And the average Hindu, the moderate Hindu, who we don't hear of too often, 
What did they think? He said, oh, narrow, independence, no Mughals, no British, no Central Asiatics, no Pinkos from Northwestern Europe. So now we have our own country and we have our own prime minister, Nehru. He is going to give us a fair um, a play. What happened? Nehru said, Muslim first appeasement must continue. We've been scarred by partition. Therefore, I will codify Hindu personal law, but I will not dare codify Muslim personal law. And in 1955, he did that, but he did not codify to this day. Muslim personal law has not been codified. Muslims say, Oh, as far as the IPC and the CRPC is concerned, oh, we absolutely agree with the Indian IPC and the CRPC. We don't want a hand cut off under Sharia, but under personal law, marriage, adoption, succession, inheritance, divorce, oh, we want our own personal law. So that kind of appeasement went on to the anger of the Hindu moderate, because the Hindu is a very moderate person. He's been tolerating all this for hundreds of years. Finally, when the Nehru consensus did not give him what he felt was a fair and even a playing field, then it became right. Indian politics became right for the kind of politics that we're seeing from the BJP. So when you have polarization, scratch beneath the surface, look on the surface, go deep into the reasons for it. And the reasons go back many decades and centuries. And the outcome is obvious. We know polarization. We know about Hindu Rashtra and majoritarianism. But no one goes beyond the surface and says what I've just said in the past five minutes. That has to be imbibed by people so that we have genuine secularism, which means four words. Appease no one. Empower everyone. Four words. You have also mentioned in the book that there is appeasement, but not empowerment of the minorities. Absolutely. Yes, explain this concept. What do you mean by empowerment and appeasement? Now, appeasement means you tell Muslims that, look, you are terrific. You can keep your personal law. We'll make Hindu personal law codified. But no, you're, you're special. Uh, we regard you as like an exotic species, like a black buck to be protected not to be empowered, no education. You won't get any kind of benefit as far as healthcare is concerned, education is concerned, which is why Sacha and Mishra, both the commission reports, what did they say? Muslims are the most impoverished people, even more than SC and ST. After 70, 75 years, 76 now of independence. And the reason is appeasement, where you throw a little uh, mollycoddle at um, uh, Muslims and say, vote for us every five years, be on your side. The other, uh -uh, don't vote for them. Create fear in them, because they will massacre you. Vote for us, we'll come to you once in five years. We won't give you education. We won't give you healthcare. We won't give you anything which will empower you. But we will appease you. We'll not codify your laws. We'll, as Manmohan Singh said 15 years ago, Muslims have the first right to India's resources. So that's the difference between appeasement and empowerment. Yeah, Mr. Merchant, Mr. Merchant, but explain this to me. Do you think that Muslims are empowered by Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Is he empowered? Not yet. 70 years, they were appeased and not empowered for 70 years. In the past nine and a half years, the kind of empowerment that Muslims have received has not been significant. But there has been one single point which people in their blindness and their hatred for Mr. Modi uh, completely miss out. And what is that? That when you send out food subsidies or water on tap, last mile electrification, send out health insurance and so on and so forth, bags of food. There's no Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Parsi written on that. That is secularism. That's secular welfare benefit. How much has it empowered Muslims? It's empowered them as much as it has empowered Parsis or Christians or Hindus. Because it goes with religion hyphen neutral benefits. There's no siphoning off and there's no religion written on top of it. So in nine and a half years, has he, has Mr. Modi actually empowered Muslims? As I said a minute ago, not 
significantly. But why not significantly? Because to roll back the backwardness of 70 years and indeed of 150 years is difficult. But I do believe that whatever he's trying to do with the Pasmanda Muslims, etc., what he really must now do is to make medical care, health and education out of madrasas, put science courses, English courses, because I have run two media enterprises, two startups. I've hired Muslims, I've hired Christians. Mr. Mr. Merchant, Mr. Merchant, your theory in this book is far apart from the ground realities. Let's move to Sorry? the discussion. Let's come to the Congress. Let me finish what I was saying, but it doesn't matter. I have a good memory, so I'll come yeah. back to that. You carry on with your interruption. Let's move on to the other, other topic now, the Congress. You have mentioned that Sonia Gandhi right from 2000. No, before you go on to other topics, you said something about the book. Repeat that. Yeah, let me, let's move to the Congress now. As you have mentioned in the book, since 2007, Sonia Gandhi had kept an eye on Prime Minister Narendra Modi. But she did, did she fail to stop him in becoming the Prime Minister? Or did Sonia Gandhi entirely fail? No, no, Sonia Gandhi failed because her government failed. Sonia Gandhi was running the government, UPA 1 and UPA 2, behind the scenes. Manmohan Singh did a very good job, and he's a very, very nice man. After all, he's the man. Not only am I the biographer of Rajiv Gandhi, uh, but I'm also, when I wrote my biography of Aditya Vikram Birla, it was Dr. Manmohan Singh who was the chief guest at my uh, function, at my release, at the Nehru Center. At the Nehru Center. Manmohan Singh who was sitting next to me uh, at that launch. So I have, and we've corresponded a lot. We met obviously at the Nehru Center during the launch of my book a few years ago on Mr. Birla. So I had great respect for uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh. I have another Sima Rao and his liberalization, whose liberalization and his entire avatar has been kept in a black hole by the Congress for their own parochial reasons. So Sonia didn't fail in stopping Mr. Modi. It's the country's electorate whose mood has changed in 2014. That stopped the Congress from coming back to power. They went to 206 seats, 244. Sonia Gandhi wasn't responsible. Of course, she was responsible uh, for, to an extent, the policy paralysis. But it was ultimately a technocratic government with Chidambaram as a finance minister after 2013, he brought in Raghuram Rajan as the RBI governor in September 2013, who, along with Chidambaram, made sure that evergreening of NPAs continued and there was no, uh, re no review of NPAs and bank balances till 2015. And it's only in 2015 when Raghuram Rajan was still the RBI governor that balance sheets of the banks began to be cleaned up and it's only in 2016, after Mr. Raghuram Rajan left the RBI, that things improved. And today, banks are doing very well because of eight years of vacuum cleaning. What about Priyanka Gandhi? You have completely written her off. You say she started in 91 and at 52, her political career is over. Why do you feel so? I haven't let her off. I've talked about her in considerable detail in that chapter. Not only was she very much with her mother, to pick up uh, Rajiv Gandhi's body when that uh, he, uh, terrible uh, bomb uh, exploded, Dhanu, the bomb, uh, LTT bomber at Shiparam Nadur. And it happened obviously at 9.30 or 10, 10 in the night. And I reached Chennai the very next morning at six in the morning and drove in an auto rickshaw to Shiparam Nadur. At about nine o'clock in the morning, I was in Shiparam Nadur within 12 hours of the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi. At 5 a.m., an Indian Air Force plane had taken Priyanka and Sonia Gandhi back to Delhi uh, with, with Rajiv's body. And I met everyone. At that time, Karthikeya and the chief investigators and so on. So Priyanka was very much in control even then. She was only 19, but she was very much there. I written about her in UP. That was the last chance in the last assembly election, and she failed. Uh, I've talked about her, how she put a comforting arm around Rahul Gandhi and how close the siblings are. Uh, so I've not written her off. I just basically feel that dynastic politics is a bad
that idea and B in capitals, idea in capital I. It's a bad idea. And people conflate Danish. Oh, an actor's son, daughter becomes an actor. So that's okay. Uh, shareholding, a builder or a tata become, will, will uh, inherit. But they make a stupid mistake in not realizing two or three things. Number one, I won't take too much time on this, but it's an important subject on dynasty. Why you must not conflate dynasty in business and, and acting in law and accountancy with dynasty in politics. Politics is a public service. It's meant to widen choices to the public. You're not in charity. You're basically doing a public service. In business, there's a shareholding. You obviously inherit the shareholding. An actor goes up or down every Friday. Someone like Devan and Son did nothing. If you look at the women in Bollywood at the top, whether it's a Katrina Kaif or a Deepika Padukone or anyone else, most of them, they're not dynasts. What is Deepika Padukone's father? Badminton Chan. What is Katrina Kaif's father? Not many will know about him because he left at an early stage. He certainly wasn't in films. Akshay Kumar, etc. If you look at the entire gamut of Bollywood people, even lawyers and accountants, only one or two percent, maybe five percent, actually joined the daddy's business. I didn't join my father's business, even though the shareholder I could have. He had several but factories. Then there are many dynasts in BJP as well. If there are dynasts, yes, that's the second point I want to make. That's a big misunderstanding. Well. So that is totally wrong. What I am against is at the top. Dynasty is bad. First, you must remember that do not conflate uh, dynasty in politics, the dynasty in business, and uh, in everything else, other professions. Professional qualifications, that's not a public service where you're supposed to widen the choice. Mr. Brinda doesn't have that uh, obligation, but politicians have that obligation. Now, your point. Mr. Uh, no, let me finish the point I'm making, Dash. Uh, you ask the question, let me finish it. Yeah. As far as, um, as, far as this. Um, the point that you were making about the BJP and the industries, also there in the BJP, everyone says, oh, right now seeing Sun Prakash or whatever his name is, is in politics. And the Dumas, the one is the chairman of the IPL, one the chairman here, there, Anurag Thakur. I completely disparage that. I think that they shouldn't be there. I absolutely disagree with dynasty at every level. But the real dynasty problem is at the top. There's no Modi dynasty. There's no Sitaraman dynasty. There's no Goyal dynasty. There's no Jaishankar dynasty. What is Jaishankar's father? He has the Brahmanian. He was a columnist in my media startup for 20 years. The father of a nuclear doctrine, he the Brahmanian. Head of the IDSA, Defense of Study and Health. So, at the top, no Modi dynasty. There's a Gandhi dynasty. No Bhagwad dynasty. RSS, chairman or whatever they're called, the head is not going to be a Bhagwad son. So, that Mr. is a, a point that you Mr. 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 Merchant, Mr. Merchant, I am terribly running out of time and it's showing me only yes. six minutes left. Sorry? So I am skipping four questions and coming to my last question. Yes. Do you feel and do you think that Modi is going to win 2024 Lok Sabha elections? Uh, I think he might, but it's not a given because there are two things. One is that when you have seat sharing, between 28 parties and have one-to-one -one fights with a powerful uh, party like the BJP is. There's no guarantee that the cannibalization of votes will not take place. And therefore, in a straight fight in many of the states across the country, uh, the India acronym, the opposition, uh, will have an advantage. That could erode the number of seats that the BJP would otherwise have got. So it's not a given. I think Mr. Modi will probably win. I've said that before in television interviews that he's got an 80% chance of winning. People criticize me and say, whoa, 80%. No, it's 100%. And I tell them, no, it's not 100%. It's not even 90%. And being generous in 80%. Because you can't be complacent. We don't ever forget 2004 and what happened in India shining. So it would not be easy win for Mr. Modi in 2024. Sorry? It would not be an easy win for Mr. Modi in 2024. No, it's not a it's not a, a definite victory. 
it's likely because the mood of the nation is definitely in its favor. There are two elements in winning or losing. One is the arithmetic, that's the seat sharing and the vote share. And the second is chemistry. Now, how will that chemistry affect? Because Mr. Modi has the chemistry with the people of India. And Rahul Gandhi had made such a serious mistake in criticizing or abusing Mr. Modi directly when he knows very well from past experience that it actually rebounds on you when you uh, criticize Modi. He saw that with Manisha Kaya's comment on, on uh, Chaiwala in 2014, and he saw it with his own comment on Chokidar Chokhe. And yet he's not learned from the mistakes. What uh, Rahul Gandhi should do, set up a um, shadow cabinet, defense, economic policy, foreign affairs, and give pinpoint suggestions and options to the government. So there, so the, this shadow, uh, shadow cabinet you have talked in the book, so they should not directly target Mr. Modi. This is the only way they, in the Indian alliance can win the election. Today, they should target Mr. Modi on issues, not personally. I don't know why they don't have the brains to realize that if you make one mistake, it's carelessness. You make two mistakes, maybe a coincidence. You make the third mistake in the third election, then it's stupidity. So I'm saying that attack Mr. Modi, but on issues, not on personalities that he's niche or he's that or he's uneducated. Education. Do you think Sonia Gandhi has an education? No, she doesn't. She went to England to learn English at the Norton School of English in Cambridgeshire because she came from a very poor family, the minor family, which in fact was as poor as Modi's own family. So, you know, there's no point in attacking him for his education. Otherwise, I have to attack Sonia for her lack of education. No point in um, attacking him for his poverty. We have to attack the Gandhi family on the maternal side for their poverty. M Mr. Merchant, I'm terribly running out of time. So, India no should not attack Mr. Modi personally, but they should attack him on the issues. That That's is right. the finding point for this interview, Mr. Merchant. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Danish. Please subscribe to our channel Reportage and press the bell icon to remain updated.